Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to a really very exciting lunch symposium sponsored by Rada. And we're going to hear and learn something about a new, not really that new lens, an intraocular, plus, uh, intraocular lens, so-called PLUS IOL. Um, and we have a really exciting panel here as well. Welcome, thank you for taking your time. It's just right beside me, Claudette Abela Formanek from Vienna, the so-called AKH Vienna. She's going to give us an insight on her experience with the toric IL of the of the Rainer Ray One EMV toric intraocular lens. And then next to uh, Claudette, we have Masara Masara Laginov from the UK, from London. She's going to talk about a very, a very, very uh, interesting comparative study on the Ray-1 EMV in comparison to the typical of VVT lens from Alcon. I'm really looking forward to hearing your results. And last but not least, from Poland, Andrzejew, uh, that's correct? Andrzej, Andrzej Dimitriev um, from Poznan is going to introduce um, a very I think very important for in future getting even more important prompts, patient related outcome measurement platform, uh, the Raypro from Rainer. And I think this is a really a great opportunity for us to see your result and how you deal with this new uh, kind of patient uh, uh, care. So going to let's start. Uh, I was told to give just a short introduction. Uh, Professor Abela Formanek is head of clinical, or head of the clinic for cataract and refractive surgery and day clinic for ophthalmology and optometry in the Medical University of Vienna. She is not only specialized in cataract surgery but also in retina. But today we're going to talk about cataract surgery, and Thank she's you. going to give us a talk on uh, navigating precision insights into rotational stability with the Ray One EMV Toric. Hello, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and I thank Reina for inviting me to speak over here at the symposium. So I'll be presenting a case series of patients with cataract and astigmatism and the implantation of the Ray-1 EMV toric. So the increasing demand for spectacle-free independence in all distances has encouraged the production of um, a presbyopia controlling lenses or limiting lenses. And we know that when you implant lenses for presbyopia correcting lenses, you have to correct also the astigmatism. We know that about 30% of the population of the general cataract population have got one to over one diopter of um, astigmatism. And when we implant uh, presbyopia correcting lenses, we need to correct the toric with a toric lens. So the advantage of implanting a monofocal enhanced lens is that we try to bypass all the negative side effects of implanting a multifocal lens. The multifocal lenses are capable of correcting, um, spec correcting um, visual acuity at different distances, but there's a downside to the multifocal lenses. Um, because many people have dysphotopsias and um, a decrease in contrast sensitivity. So how does the Ray-1 EMV work? It's got an aspheric anterior surface and it has a unique center region which induces a controlled positive spherical aberration and that is actually the effect of the extended depth of vision. It is a non-diffractive lens which, um, which, which is good against the dysphotopsias as compared to diffractive optics. So the patented Ray-1 EMV positive spherical aberration design works together with the natural positive spherical aberration of the cornea to achieve about 1.5 diopters of enhanced vision between the distance and intermediate vision. So we included um, patients with cataract without any other ocular pathologies. We performed um, anterior segment OCT to measure astigmatism or total corneal astigmatism we used the uh, KZR2 of Tomai and the CSO MS39, 
And we, input, we use the K values of the opticals of uh, the CSO MS39 uh, because it has an optical zone of 4.5 millimeters. We also did the barometry with the IOL Master 700 and we introduced these results in the ray trace calculator online. So postoperatively, we looked at the IOL decentration, tilt and rotation using the Acacia at one hour, one week, one month and six months. And postoperatively, we did the visual acuity tests at distance, intermediate and near at one week, one month and six months. This is just to show you what we did. We make sure when we do the preoperative measurements that the patients, when they're on the chin rest, that their pupils are at this in the same lines just by shifting the equipment left to right. And you make sure that the patients are really sitting properly in the chin rest. And like that, we get reproducible results. And these are the results at one hour, one week, and one month of one patient, where you can see that with the infrared uh, image, we can see the markings of the lens and we super we we interpolate a, a line between these two markings and read the axis of the of the lens so in this way we were able to do a very easy uh, control uh, which can be done in any clinical setting uh, of the rotation of the lens so the lens we operate from the temporal side and we operate at the zero degree axis the lens um, is placed in the capsular bag, and it's very important to ensure that you have a circular capsular axis with an overlapping uh, circular capsular axis, and that you remove the uh, viscoelastic from behind the lens to ensure that the lens does not rotate postoperatively. To mark the uh, axis, we use the Callisto system where we compare the, the image preoptively, which was made at, uh, the, uh, with the environmenter with the IOL Master 700, and compare it to the vesculature uh, image of the Callisto intraoperatively, and that's the way we achieve our axis. So coming to the results, we had 31 eyes where uh, 22 eyes were binocular results, and um, they were average results just like in any cataract patient group of patients. The pre-op uh, refraction, cylinder refraction, was at 2.29 diopters, and the pre-op corneal astigmatism was also at around two diopters between one and three cylinder diopters. The post-operative uh, spherical equivalent at six months was at minus 0 0.5 um, spheres or diopter spheres and the residual cylinder was at 0 0.42 diopters at a range of 0 to 1.25. This is just an example of a patient who was operated binocularly, a highly myopic patient with high astigmatism and when you look at the bottom line you can see that the binocular uncorrected visual acuity was at 0 0.8 and the immediate intermediate visual acuity was also at 0 0.8 which is actually very good for somebody who was very myopic and with a high astigmatism and the near vision was at Jaeger 1. Now coming to the um, cylinder results or the outcome this is a double angle plot. On the left hand side, you see the results uh, before surgery, and you can see the widespread of the cylinder, um, cylinder diopters. And here, if you look here, this was the pre op value before surgery and the mean absolute value after surgery. And we were at an average of a mean absolute of 0 0.5 diopters with a standard deviation of 0 0.28 diopters. After six months, um, we only had no, 21 eyes who turned up for follow-up and the results were similar at 0 0.42 diopters with a standard deviation of 0 0.32. Looking at rotational stability, we compared the results target to one hour and then we used the one hour result actually as the control to see if the lens has rotated or not. So looking at this column over here, we had a rotation of under two degrees between the one hour and the one month and six month um, results. And uh, on the left hand side, you see the results of each patient and you can see that there's hardly any movement except in two patients. And um, the same goes for here. So this is the result after one hour to one week, one hour to one month and one hour to six months. So the results are pretty good. It's all bit below five degrees. We know that the isonorm for rotation is um, that 10% of the patients, I mean, sorry, 90% of the patients would be within 10 degrees 
and 95% of the patients should be 20 degrees. That's the Eisen norm for toric lenses. These are the results of the residual refractive astigmatism, which we, of course, measured subjectively. This is the, the refraction. And uh, we had 95% of the patients within one diopter of astigmatism and 81 patients within 0.5 diopters of astigmatism. These are the results of the first and I results of the EMB toric, where you can see that the results are pretty similar at um, one below one diopter. Uh, we had better results within the 0.5 diopter where they had 74%. The prediction error is the difference between our target um, refraction and um, what actually turned up after uh, turned out after surgery. So 95% um, were within one diopter, 60% were within half a diopter, and about 40% were within a quarter of a diopter. These are comparable results to cataract, normal cataract patients with um, other lenses. So the visual acuity, we did the best corrected visual acuity at uh, one month and at six months. And um, we also checked the uncorrected uh, visual acuity at distance, intermediate and near. And when we look at the results, we had 30 eyes after one month where we had um, a log mar of a distance at um, 0 0.15. And the, oh, sorry, there we are. This is the best corrected visual acuity and this is the uncorrected visual acuity at distance. And we had log mar of 0 0.1 and at six months it was practically the same. And binocularly it was almost zero. And the Jaeger, Jaeger was actually very good. It was somewhere between 2.4 and around 2.4 and 2, which means that the reading capability was actually better than reading newspaper. And the intermediate was also just as good. And on the left, you can see that it's in decimal. So it's maybe depending how you prefer to see visual acuity tests. Tilt and decentration, the tilt was within 5 degrees. That's also very good. Um, a tilt uh, beyond above 10 degrees would cause uh, clinical relevance and the patients would have a higher astigmatism. And when we look at decentration, here we are, we have um, 0 0.2 millimeters. It's very stable. The lens doesn't decentrate very much, which are also very good results. Um, these are the plots of the individual patients for tilt and decentration, and you can see most of them remain pretty stable. And um, here we are again, the lens decentration in millimeters. There's a very nice publication where 5,000 eyes were included after cataract surgery and the implantation of a toric lens. These are real world data, and 27% uh, there was, um, this is actually very interesting, the difference vector between the targeted and the calculated residual astigmatism was 0 0.8 diopters. And the main source of error was um, uh, the preoperative measurement of the cornea. So it's very important when you're doing measurements for toric lenses to use um, different biometers and keratometers and topographs uh, to measure the toric and to make sure that the patients are really sitting properly in the chin rest and that the pupils are in line. And of course, the interoperative IOL misalignment, it uh, depends how, what method you use, how, how exact you are with marking your, your limbus to implant the lens. So these are the most important um, things to do when you want to have better precision in the implantation of toric lenses. So in summary, the patients were very satisfied. Uh, we had a significant cylinder reduction. Uh, we had a very, uh, it has a very uh, high rotational stability and we did not have to rotate any lenses. Uh, we had a predictable refractive accuracy and uh, the uncorrected distance visual acuity was similar to that of a standard monofocal IOL. The range of vision extension with excellent uncorrected intermediate visual acuity and we also had a very good functional uncorrected near visual acuity. So take home message for the implantation of this lens and any toric lens in the end effect is to have a very careful pre-op screening and patient selection and um, it's very important to have very reliable measurements before surgery and to perform meticulous cataract surgery with a small uh, clear corneal incision, capsulorexis, overlap 
and removal of viscoelastic. And we also tell our patients to remain relatively quiet after surgery and they should not read for about a week so that we avoid the saccadic movements of the eye. And uh, we check the position of the lens after about two weeks. And we, have, uh, we do a refinement of the position only when it's over 10 degrees, when, it's, uh, when there's a rotation of over 10 degrees, and when the patient also has subjective um, problems. Otherwise, we do not actually re-rotate re the lens. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Claudette, for this excellent talk, presenting your wonderful data. Um, we are going to have a panel discussion at the end of the session. However, uh, if you'd like to ask Claudette now a question concerning her talk, just feel free. If not, I would have a question for you. Uh, you, you had a really excellent uncorrected intermediate uh, vision acuity, um, because, but you didn't use the, the, the monovision concept, did you? Or did I miss it? We did monovision. Uh, we, yes, what we did was um, we um, um, we implanted the first eye normally at about the first minus, and then the second eye the, at half a diopter after the, half a diopter away from that, more myopic. But we also took into consideration the needs of the patients. So if patients rather had more distance, we implanted both eyes with distance. So this is not um, a mini monovision concept. We practically um, operated how the patients need to, mm -hmm. what kind of... Um, what they do, how old they are, whether they're very active or more sedentary. And, uh, but the main uh, attitude towards uh, implantation of the lens and uh, the refraction, uh, the target refraction is minus 0 0.25 for the first eye. Minus 0 0.25. Right, and then the second eye would be uh, minus 0 0.5 or minus 0 0.75. And you, know, you have not been doing same-day procedures? Yes, all. we have. But the binocular eyes are same-day procedures. Same-day procedures, yeah. Okay. In, the, in, well, in all eyes or just in... No, we had um, 11 patients with binocular oh. and the rest were monocular. Okay. Any questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. We, are going to, we proceed to Dr. Masara Laginov. Uh, she's a double fellowship trained consultant of Talmic surgeon based, on, based at the OCL <laughs> Vision in London. She is specialized, specialized in cornea, cataract and refractive surgery providing bespoke solutions, including laser, ICL, and premium IR technology. She's a surgical trainer and examiner for the Royal College of Ophthalmologists and an ECRS video competition winner. Thank you so That's much so for like sharing it. your data. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Thank you and much. actually, she's really very happy to, 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 to listen to your talk because we're going to hear a comparison of the Ray-1 EMV and the VVT. <laughs> Thank Compare visual much. outcomes and patient satisfaction. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you to Rainer for having me speak today. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about the Ray-1 EMV versus Vividi study that we carried out at OCL Vision in London, UK, comparing the visual outcomes and patient satisfaction. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about our story specifically. So in July 2020, we implanted the first ever Ray-1 EMV lens in the world. Um, please let me know if that is not correct, anyone from Rainer. Um, but to our knowledge, it was. And that was performed by my mentor, Alan Barsom, who was a founding director of our clinic. So believe it or not, this lens has been in use for over three years now. And my journey started with collecting that early data and presenting the first real world outcomes in the CRST uh, Rainer supplement in 2021. I then started my own private practice in September 2022, and the first premium lens that I implanted was indeed the EMV lens, closely followed by the Toric EMV. So we have a wealth of knowledge and information regarding the lens, and one of the things people were interested in is EMV versus Vivity. That's a topic of conversation that seemed to come up time and time again. So we decided to carry out a retrospective six-month follow-up study comparing the EMV lens with the Acrosoft IQ Vivity lens. This was a monocentric comparative study looking at bilateral implantations. We looked at the objective assessments, so the VA and refractive outcomes, but also the subjective outcomes, so the RayPro uh, questionnaire and software to ascertain patient satisfaction rates. We had approximately 300 eyes per group and the mean age was 70 years old. So looking at the investigated IOL design, we know that the Ray-1 EMV induces a small amount of positive, positive spherical aberration it has no zones or diffractive technology within the lens. 
and is very well tolerated by patients. The Vivity lens works slightly differently by inducing a small amount of negative spherical aberration, and it has a central elevation that elongates the wavelength and increases depth of focus. This slide, courtesy of Damien Gatinell, shows, uh, highlights the work done by Dr. Benjamin Stern and Damien, looking at the uh, performance and optical design of the lens using the Nemo Tempo. And they found that the Vivity IOL showed a wider, possibly diffractive step, which was in line with that in vivo magnification of the optic under the microscope. And so there may be some diffractive element to how this lens works. Professor Findle showed the halo size was significantly smaller with the EMV lens versus the Vivity lens, and this is likely also due to the lens design. So looking at our study, the demographics, we had around 300 eyes per group with a mean age of 70 years old. The IOL power ranged from 10 to 30 diopters. And we had an IOL cylinder for our toric IOLs of around 1.5 diopters. The delta K was an average less than one diopter for both groups. For the toric lenses, we implanted bilateral toric EMV lenses in 84 eyes in the EMV group and 126 eyes in the Vivity group. The majority of our patients, as you can see, have astigmatism between minus 0.5 and minus 1.5, and we're quite a refractive heavy practice, so we do tend to have a low tolerance for implanting uh, toric lenses. Most eyes were targeted for emetropia, so over 60% in both groups, and approximately 10% more eyes in the Vivity group were targeted for somewhere between minus 0.75 and minus 1. And that's probably because in the Vivity group, we were trying to achieve more spectacle independence, hence the use of an EDOF lens. Looking at our refractive accuracy, so both lenses actually performed really well with over 70% of patients or eyes achieving within half a diopter of refractive spherical equivalent target. And almost all patients within one diopter, which is better than the UK benchmark. Now let's come on to the visual acuity outcomes. So I'm going to present the binocular visual acuity outcomes. Um, the first group was both eyes targeted for plano or amotropia. And as you can see, the uncorrected distance visual acuity in both groups was excellent. But the uh, p-value shows that the EMV group was statistically significantly better for uncorrected distance visual acuity. The uh, near visual acuity in the Vivity group was statistically significantly better by about one line of vision, and the intermediate vision was equivalent in both groups. Now we come on to mini monovision, so looking at the dominant eye for Plano and the non-dominant eye for uh, minus 0.25 to minus 0.5 diopters. What we see here is that the uncorrected distance visual acuity remains better in the EMV group by about half a line, and that is statistically significant. The intermediate vision is much the same between the two groups, very excellent uh, intermediate vision. And the near visual acuity in the Vivity group is still significantly better by about a line of vision, which you would expect with the EDOF lens design. What's interesting now is we come on to the moderate monovision offset. So the dominant eye for Plano and the non-dominant eye for between minus 0.5 to minus one diopters. And what's interesting here is you still have that maintenance of the excellent uncorrected distance visual acuity in both groups, statistically significantly better in the EMV group. Intermediate vision, again, is very similar between the two groups. But when you look at the uncorrected near visual acuity, you start to see that the performance of the EMV, when you target a little bit more myopia, you start to lose the statistical significance that you saw with the Vivity lens. So the near vision is equivalent to the Vivity lens now. So with a modest monovision up to minus one diopters with the EMV lens, you're able to, you're able to achieve a similar level of uncorrected near visual acuity to the Vivity lens, but you're still maintaining that statistically significant superior uncorrected distance visual acuity. And that's a really interesting finding. Looking now at the uh, outcomes of the toric IOLs. More eyes in the Ray-1 EMV group had a post-operative refractive cylinder of 0.25 diopters or less, so that's 61% versus uh, 46%. But overall, the, the outcomes of both lenses were very good, with 91% of eyes in the EMV group achieving less than 0.75 diopters of sill and 86% in the Vivity group. Now we come on to the subjective patient-reported outcome measures. So we asked our patients to rate their satisfaction rate with the surgery. Uh, we sent this to 300 patients who had uh, binocularly implanted uh, 
EMV versus Vivity. And we had a response rate of just under 42%, with the EMV satisfaction rate pipping Vivity to the post with 84% satisfi satisfaction versus 78%. So the conclusions of the study were that the Ray-1 EMV demonstrated a statistically significant better binocular uncorrected distance visual acuity. The binocular intermediate visual acuity was excellent in both groups and was equivalent to that achieved uh, EMV versus Vivity was very much the same. There was a very good level of uncorrected near visual acuity in the EMV group, but slightly better in the Vivity group, particularly for uh, emetropic aim or mini monovision aim. And that is to be expected considering the positioning of the positioning of the lens as an EDOF lens. However, when you had a monovision offset of up to minus one diopter, that resulted in the binocular uncorrected near visual acuity of the EMV closely matching that of the Vivity group. There was more effective postoperative cylinder reduction in the EMV toric group, with 61% of eyes achieving a postoperative refractive cylinder of less than 0.25 versus 46 in the Vivity group. They there was a higher patient satisfaction rate in the EMV group, and I describe this as my headache-free IOL. So future considerations, it would be very useful to perform a targeted subgroup analysis, really comparing like for like with specific um, comparisons of exact refractive targets. It would be interesting to investigate a higher level of monovision to see whether you can achieve greater levels of near vision with the EMV lens versus Vivity lens. Further Ray Pro questionnaire results comparing the refractive subgroups and more advanced IOL uh, technologies, and performing a cost benefit analysis across different advanced technology IOL models. I would like to acknowledge the surgeons at OCL Vision who operated on these patients, the optometric team, and the RD team who were pivotal in the success of this study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Great results. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yeah, of course. When you increase the monovision, is it usually the EMV group that needs the distance-visual acuity um, on the eye, or is it both groups that need it? So both groups were like for like. So the dominant eye was always targeted for Plano, and the non-dominant eye in that moderate monovision group, it ranged from 0.51 to minus 1, but really the majority of patients were over minus 0.6 diopters and the majority of those groups were somewhere between minus 0.75 and minus 1, but it was very much the same in both groups. Yes, so it really was like for like, but doing a more targeted subgroup analysis would give us more information. So when you increased the monovision in the Rayner group, you yes. also increased it in the VVT group. This was the question, I suppose. Um, you know what I mean? That you're, you're, you're not comparing Apple and... Yeah. We, we compared the range. Yes, so minus 0.51 to minus 1. We, we compared those two groups. What's supposed to say? But what we would like to do is do a more tar targeted subgroup analysis mm. to, to see if that's maintained. Uh, I've also a question concerning your monovision concept, how you do it. Do you do, you, do, you do the same day surgery like the Viennese group likes to do? Or do you do one eye first? If you do one eye first, which eye do you do first? Do you do the... Uh, the which one of the, uh, the, the eyes do you do first? So 60%, around 60% of our patients are binocular simultaneous same-day okay. surgery. Um, and 40% roughly were uh, staggered. And it really depended on which eye had the worst cataract or which eye they wanted us to do first. It was very rarely a choice based on um, targeting Plano or targeting uh, myopia. Um, sometimes in patients who'd had laser refractive surgery, we may target the non-DOM eye for myopia okay. first this was actually my for question. increased accuracy yeah. okay. and then um, the DOM eye. And then really you take the information it. from the first eye. And, yes. And, okay. yes, exactly. Um, as we've learned, you have, you have the positive spherical aberration, which is the concept of the uh, Ray-1 EMV, mm -hmm. which increases the depth of focus. Uh, from this concept, we would expect that if we have intraocular lenses, with high diopters, uh, there must be even more uh, advanced effect. Yes. So what would what what I would be interested in is, did you invest in the, in the, the, those uh, patients who were hyperopic with higher intraocular lenses in comparison to the myopic patients? Do you see an additional advantage in those patients? We haven't studied it, but that's a really interesting area to to explore, definitely. Something for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, comments?
Thank you so much. You. Going to proceed, and now we go to Poland, Poznan. And I have the pleasure to introduce Andrzej Dimitriev. Um, he's an ophthalmologist, senior consultant, academic teacher, and anti segment surgeon at the Department of Ophthalmology, Poznan University of the Medical Science, Poland, since 2003. And he told me not to continue now, but I think it's I think Thank you it's so just worth it. It's, uh, he's a medical doctor, founder and co-owner of a private practice, private clinic, the Reoptis in St. Albert Hospital in Poznan. And I think that's the reason why you really have a very interest in the, in the next topic we're talking, we're talking about, because having a private setting, we want to have very happy patients. And this is what you're going to talk about. It's the patient-centric practice, harnessing PROMS, patient-rated outcome measurements for optimal ophthalmic care. Thank you. Thanks so much for this kind of introduction and thank you to Rainer for the you know, invitation to, to speak today. Uh, so um, it is really um, a matter of choices. And uh, uh, in case of, of being a medical director and someone who, have, who needs to form the portfolio of a clinic, sometimes it's not easy to make choices and they are based on clinical studies. And uh, I was delighted to see the studies uh, within the last two presentations, because uh, this is actually uh, the field where we are work working right now. And um, without the clinical data, you cannot actually assess uh, the needs of your patient. But I'll try to convince you that it's not just clinical data which you need, you need the input from the patient as well. So um, if you were present during um, um, the autumn ESCRS last year, you, you probably had a chance to uh, listen to Professor Graham Bart. And um, I think that, that this sentence gives you a lot of inputs regarding what can be achieved um, um, and what results in best, uh, best satisfaction of the patient with potential least uh, compromises, uh, which is very important where you consider forming the portfolio of, of your clinic. So obviously when, when you get started and you develop your practice, uh, uh, it's so important to know uh, what would be the, the lowest um, level of the IOL which is offered and the highest level. And it's so important to understand the needs of patients uh, then. And that is why we see uh, EMV as, as a lens with uh, extremely high potential in uh, every part of this portfolio. Then by selecting patients and selecting offsets, selecting monovision, we're trying to play a little bit more. We're trying to squeeze a little bit the lens uh, to, get, to get more um, uh, uncorrected uh, vision from that. And finally, if you want to see what your patients consider regarding the outcomes, you need to find a reasonable way of assessing uh, the patient needs and assessing uh, the outcome of your surgery. And uh, I think RayPro, and I'll try to convince you that RayPro is a perfect system to do that. So uh, when you get started and uh, you're developing your practice with, uh, with uh, any type of the lens, it's so important to understand which group of patients are you targeting. And uh, basically right now we are, co we are confused by different groups of lenses, by, by the companies uh, which are uh, giving specific names, uh, like EDOF uh, became a gold standard of, uh, of the name, but it doesn't always mean the same. So we know that within EDOF group, we, uh, we have monofocal plus lenses, we have lenses which are diffractive, which, which shouldn't be a part of this group actually. but. That is even more confusing for the surgeons trying to select the IOL spectrum. And so we had exactly the same issue. And I think many of you have the same issue when, uh, when you're trying to consider which lenses should be taken uh, into consideration when you're, um, when you're doing this. So uh, in our part of Europe, uh, unfortunately, when it comes to reimburse surgery, um, the lowest quality hydrophilic lenses, I mean, the lenses uh, which not origin from EU or US, uh, uh, sometimes are, are uh, reaching even 50 or 60 percent of the market and that's a big problem when it comes to the quality. So uh, I called it e Econo. Then we had a classic um, uh, hydrophilic white lens from reasonable manufacturers. Then we have a monofocal premium lens from uh, the bus companies uh, which, we, which we know and uh, for the quality is uh, it's acknowledged. Then finally uh, we, we consider that theoretically when it comes to the value hydrophobic material gives a little bit more uh, clinical advantage. Uh, and we still question the uh, yellow filters. We, we still don't know whether there's a, a real clinical benefit, but it was considered by many to be like a standard plus. So as you see, uh, you have four different choices within, within the portfolio. 
and you haven't even started considering the extending uh, range of vision. And then you realize that uh, then you have groups of lenses which actually give you more optical quality, and these are monofocal plus in need of lenses. So if you ask your uh, doctors or if you ask your optometrists to inform the patients that you have so many different choices, I don't really believe that um, anyone um, of the staff would, would use them. It's impossible to do that. So I considered that before, and I thought that actually forming a portfolio between a monofocal premium, so high quality monofocal lens, and a premium package, which is, which is either EDOF or a monofocal lens, is reasonable and it's much easier to make choices then. And uh, we actually had it until uh, September last year. But starting with this choice of uh, monofocal, high quality monofocal lens and uh, either for multifocal lens, I think it's not enough because uh, we see how market uh, changed within the last years. We see that uh, the, the lenses with extremely high quality of optics uh, uh, in, in case of EMV using positive aberrations completely redefined our, our practice and we, we must find a place for, uh, for this group of lenses within the portfolio. So that's the main reason why we thought that uh, the monofocal plus or the lenses with uh, extended range of vision, uh, which, which are uh, theoretically uh, based on monofocal platform, a reasonable solution for the standard uh, of the surgery. And uh, you still have uh, EDOF and multifocal lenses. And I think uh, the reasonable solution can be taken between these two. And uh, that's why I made a decision in October that uh, we stopped offering any monofocal IOLs since that moment. And uh, we don't offer them anymore. I don't, I don't find any reason why, should, why we should still offer monofocal lenses if we have so many studies uh, convincing us that the quality of distant vision, even uh, uh, in low light conditions, is exactly the same. So uh, generally, when you, when you look at it, uh, you think that um, considering different types of optical approach towards extending the range of vision is really confusing uh, for, for so many of us. That is why selecting specific patients and selecting specific offsets is, is so important. Uh, and uh, I was so delighted to see the uh, different groups of, uh, of mini monovision, uh, which uh, were mentioned in Masara's presentation, because you can actually see that, that playing with monovision gives you uh, much more spectacular independence when it comes to um, uh, certain lenses. So obviously, uh, you can still uh, be very conservative and start with emetropia in both eyes. And no one says you push towards monovision. If you're comfortable with that and your patients are comfortable, why wouldn't you use emetropia in both eyes? But we're trying to, to make use of the optical properties. And that is why in my clinic, uh, the mini monovision uh, is a standard of care, which is at, uh, at least like 80% of patients. And at the same time, as we're operating 80% or, or even more um, of patients, uh, both eyes same day, uh, it means that we need to plan the, the refraction, we need to plan the postoperative vision, and it's based on patient needs. And that is why we pre-select the level of monovision for each group of lenses and each group of patients. And it, it needs to be done uh, actually taking into account patient needs. So, uh, just to very briefly clarify the ranges of monovision, because uh, sometimes it's very confusing. What does it really mean to have a mini or micro monovision? Uh, I think when it comes to uh, micro monovision, it's pre pretty clear because uh, it's uh, extremely well correlated by patients. And uh, we all agree that 0.5 diopter between the eyes is something uh, what uh, is really, really uh, the easiest way of starting with monovision. But Obviously, when you're trying to extend it, when you're trying to increase the, um, the uh, offset or, uh, or, mini, or, 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 or go towards mini monovision, like levels for 0.75, one, one diopter, it changes a lot in your practice. Because first of all, you need to train your staff. You need to see uh, the outcomes from, from your patients. And I guess getting step by step is very important. And that is why we never try to start with, uh, with any lens uh, without trying the lowest uh, levels of uh, monovision first. So generally, uh, we're trying to position specific lenses. We're trying to collect all the information we have before the surgery. But does it really mean we're right? Um, we don't know that until we see the outcomes. And uh, there's always a question whether uh, we are getting true statements from the patients when you see them when you see them during follow-up visits. And I think uh, the RayPro system uh, was uh, the best setting for us to assess the patient needs and finally what we achieved uh, after surgery. So just a uh, just couple of um, main information regarding the RayPro system. 
if you're a Rainer ILA user, it's free for you. So um, you're able to use the long-term real-time monitoring system for patient reports and insights. And uh, you can actually assess uh, different types of lenses and different types of expectations and uh, see the outcomes of specific groups. And uh, if you're really willing to uh, change your practice towards uh, using patient reported outcome measurement, uh, you will uh, briefly see that actually your practice is becoming um, a gold standard in something what we could call a patient oriented uh, practice management. So we're not trying to, to do what's, what we thought is the best solution. We're trying to see uh, what is the satisfaction rate, what is the satisfaction level of our patient, and then decide what was really uh, the best solution for us. Obviously, clinical trials tell us, tell, tell us a lot, but these are just numbers. They don't tell us that much about the uh, actual quality of life. So when it comes to the um, collection of data and uh, um, when you're trying to compare different types of, uh, of lenses within, within your um, hospital or, or practice, it makes your life so much easier because sometimes we predict the outcomes. We think that one of the lenses is better than the other one. But uh, sometimes it can be very surprising for us to see that after you see the comparison, it's, uh, it's definitely different um, from, from what, what you saw uh, and what you expected. So how does it work? So we're starting um, at, at the level of, um, of one week. Uh, it's very easy to, to add patients to, uh, to the RAPRO system. You can uh, actually use batches uh, of, uh, of patients uh, to make it easier for, for your clinic. And then uh, the next visit would be after one month, three months, uh, one year, and, uh, and uh, two and three years. Actually, these are just patient-reported uh, information, which we analyze afterwards, and we can, e we can easily access uh, to the statistics of uh, what the patient is, uh, is deciding to tell us. So I think that's one of the most important outcomes of the system. And uh, I was very interested to see this data because um, uh, I'm, I'm both the user of EMV and uh, Microsoft IQ Vivity uh, in the same way as, um, as Masara is using them. And uh, it's sometimes the prediction of potential outcomes, which is on our side. And sometimes it's, it's the real uh, clinical outcomes, which we see on patient side. So as you see, the numbers are really high. So in terms of uh, the total responses, it's close to 5,000. And these are the, the data at three months. Uh, and you can see Ray1 EMV, you can see Acrosoft IQ VVT, and on the right-hand side, you can see the Tuckness eye hands. The overall satisfaction rate uh, is very similar in both VVT and EMV group, which is quite surprising. And uh, it's much better than the eye hands group. Uh, so actually, you can see that the balance between um, EDOF and, uh, and the monofocal lens with extended depth of focus is exactly the same level. And when you compare the distance, intermediate, and near values, they, they are not so differentiated between, between these two lenses, which gives you another um, question in your head, whether, whether it's just the quality of lens or it's the instruments we, we used to, um, to form um, the range of uncorrected vision. And I think uh, what we see here is that uh, the actual um, modification of mini or micro monovision tells you a lot about what we can do to push the near vision, uncorrected near vision, uh, especially in the EMV group which basically at the level of one diopter makes it uh, very similar to the outcomes of uh, VVT lens. So to understand uh, the difference between um, IOL-oriented or surgeon-oriented practice and patient-oriented practice, I think that's something which, which tells us a lot about the RAPRO system. So uh, we have lots of advantages in monitoring patients. Uh, we can easily manage patient expectations because they can actually acknowledge us if, I, if they have uh, real problems. And finally, it's much, much easier for me as someone who is managing the practice to see the real outcomes of specific surgeons, see how, how well they did and uh, whether we are really reaching the level which we, which we plan to have. And finally, just to conclude, uh, I think uh, it's, um, it's so important to try to, to simplify the selection process for the patient to simplify it for the surgeon so that it's much easier when it comes to the conversation regarding the potential outcomes, then to utilize the offsets depending on the solution which you have and depending on the optical properties of the lens, how flexible it is with these solutions. And finally, uh, instead of having the surgeon-oriented or clinic-oriented practice, change it into patient-oriented uh, or patient outcome, uh, outcome-centric clinic. Thank you so much for your attention. I, I really hope uh, we'll try to uh, 
um, uh, use the um, information uh, coming from patients and uh, their quality of life more often uh, after we um, see so many new optical properties within uh, our uh, portfolio. Thanks a lot, Angie. It was a gr great talk, and I'm sure pretty much all of you sitting in the audience is now convinced of the RAKE Pro, and I believe it's a really win-win situation because the, the, the patient definitely feels better cared for. On the one hand, the doctor learns more about his outcomes, but not only the refractive outcomes, but also the uh, functional vision outcomes. And third, you learn about the percentage of your patient satisfaction, and this can be used for definitely for, for advertisement. Is this, is this what... Yes, because what is, what uh, obviously it, it when, when, you, when you consider managing a private clinic, you need to consider marketing as well. And uh, if you know the outcomes and if you know the problems which actually your patient had, patients have, it's much easier than to plan uh, the material, the IOLs, uh, and the conversation which is used to acknowledge the solution to the patient. 